they start playing themselves as they were in high school. <laughs> oh god, that oh, would be that would be so, maybe we don't play this. Maybe yeah. we don't play this game. There's a dark place. Not? This week on Backward Compatible, the crew is joined by Brian McKittrick to talk about oddball and non-traditional tabletop RPGs, including Night Witches, 14 Days, and Ryutama, plus an extended button mosh and a tribute to Satoru Iwata. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 36 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. Hey, welcome. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And today we have a guest with us. It's Brian McKittrick, whom some of you may recognize from Roll With It, if you've been listening to that. He uh, played, uh, what was your character's name again? Freddie Black. Freddie Black, yeah. yeah. Freddie Black. And Soul if you man, haven't Freddie been Black. listening to it, go listen to it. It's awesome. And I say that not even as the GM. Co-GM? Well, <laughs> you were the GM. You were the uh, GM. Co- co-creator. It's, of the story. Co-writer, how about that? Yeah, it turned yeah. out very well. I'm, I was very impressed with how it turned out. Um, also, I was very impressed with all of the you know, sound design work that Chris put into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually... Uh, as, at the time you guys hear this, we will have also released the first episode of Roll With It Unplugged, featuring uh, Everyone is John, which Brian GM'd himself. No, no, John GM'd it, and John played it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, Everyone is John. That's correct. Um, I think John did really well on that one. Yeah, John, John, did good, John, yeah, John did do good. I don't know, John did a pretty good showing, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, I believe that he did. Mm-hmm. All and, right, uh, but now, without further ado, mm-hmm. it's time, Chris. To mosh, because I'm in mosh mode. Okay. So let's mosh. <laughs> Jim can't wait to mosh. Mosh, mosh, mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So I was playing a little bit of Sid Meier's Pirates, um, the 2004 remake. Yeah, um, and there's been three versions. Of, we talked about yeah. this a little before we started, but mm-hmm. there's been three versions. It's from uh, Microprose. Yep. So I think it was originally like 1987 on yes. DOS. And then they and had then, the uh, the Pirates Gold version mm-hmm. that was a CD-ROM game. That was the version that I played. Mm-hmm. Uh, the original version was, of course, ported to a whole bunch of systems like you know, the NES and Genesis. And SNES. That. Um, possibly so, too. I actually looked it up. It was also ported on the NES. So I didn't see SNES, but it could have been there, too. Uh, but yeah, it's an interesting. But you played the the 2004 version. So yeah, I did. Yeah. So I understand there are a few differences, and my impression was that most of the changes that came out was to, uh, or were to uh, simplify some of the systems and to maybe streamline the experience a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so what it loses in openness, it kind of gains in ease of use, if you will. Um, the, some of the interrelations between different um, systems are kind of more easily understood mm-hmm. um, or easier to learn, I should say. Um, it's intriguing in that it seems like it's definitely one of those Sid Meier's games like Civilization that's meant to be sort of played the first time and then you get it and then you play it again for essentially maximum score. Mm-hmm. Your goal is basically to amass as much wealth and status as you can before you retire from piracy um, and then you go on to live a life of uh, luxury. Um, but really, really neat little game. Um, it's definitely more um, sort of the everyone rating version of Pirate. So, you know, they skip things like scurvy and um, they don't, uh, they, they talk about pillaging and they talk about taking over ships and stuff like that, but they, it's not ultra violent at all. Even the uh, the combat is very sort of cartoony. Um, yeah, because that's the that's the game I want to play. It's Scurvy Simulator 2004. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pick up your teeth. <laughs> Eat the um, orange. But what I did find intriguing about it is because um, I was actually playing it to get inspiration for a, uh, a role-playing campaign I'm playing to GM soon uh, where we're going to be playing as pirates and so I wanted to kind of get in the mode of thinking pirate-wise. And... Um, it's interesting the way that you interact with the different factions, the Spanish, the French, the English, and the Dutch. Um, and you sort of, you, you learn the geography of the Caribbean a bit. You know, you learn where different ports are and which ones are more wealthy and which ones aren't. And, of course, you influence that through the game. Mm-hmm. Like um, taking all the wealth and putting into your trip. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, by the end of the thing, I think I was driving around in a, uh, driving sailing, <laughs> in a, um, a Spanish uh flag galleon um basically the biggest version of that particular ship i could get and so i had like a 200 plus man crew 40 cannons 
um, a couple of broadsides and ship was down. So Good actually, night. I had to hold back if I wanted to take the ship. How long did you uh, play this thing? <laughs> um, I think actual play time was about seven hours, give or take seven, eight hours. And you did that in seven hours? Yeah, it's it's not it's, it's not, not a, hard to do that. Yeah, it's not a long yeah. game. Yeah, um, and actually, there's kind of a, a story they built in the 2004 version. It's optional, um, but basically, your goal is to try to um, find and rescue your uh, lost family. Um, that kind of like eventually led you into the path that led you to piracy. Hmm. Um, so you have to find treasure map pieces that mm-hmm. lead to locations in on, on the land masses where uh, you have to use spyglass and go on shore to find these landmarks marked on the maps. Mm. But yeah. in order to get those maps, you have to um, track down the people who were involved with the plot that took down your family initially. Right. And one of them has a flag galleon. And so basically when I took over his ship, I just kept it. I, yep. seem, I seem to recall that guy, you, you fight him several times to get the map pieces, so yes. he just has terrible luck. Yeah, there, there's there's one guy, kind of like the lower level dude, I think it was um, a baron or something. Yeah. Um, and you fight him like 20 times. Yeah, he's and sort then, of like the Gilgamesh of the, <laughs> of the game, right? And then there was one guy that you fight like a few times. So, now, I'm fairly yeah. sure I played this game. I picked it up in a bargain bin somewhere. I'm sure you did. It's it, they made so many different versions. It came out for it was ported so many times. Yeah. So. Now is this the one that had like turn based combat on land? Yes. It is. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and there's like a, a ballroom dancing mini game. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. a whole bunch of little things that are that are thrown in. It's just, it was really neat the sort of things that you could do in mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. The the one downside to those is they did get redundant. Like the dancing, it's like it was kind of cool the first time, and, and after that, they it's are like all the same. I, I, yeah. You you know I can dance. Just let me like get the thing and move on instead of spending five minutes Bioshock the was sequence. the same way with its mini games mm-hmm. yeah. uh, you know it's funny because I, I actually referenced that game or, or thought about that game whenever I was playing um, Assassin's Creed 4 yeah. because Assassin's Creed 4 was finally the game that I wanted whenever I picked up that game out of the bargain bin and oh, said interesting. pirates cool mm-hmm. pirates would be awesome and I just I never I, I don't know I played maybe me Maybe an hour, maybe two hours of that mm-hmm. game. That's why I was surprised that you got advanced. Oh, Black Fo- Flag or Sid Meier's? No, Sid Meier's. Okay. Sid Meier's. The, um, oh. I beat Black Flag and, and then played it more. <laughs> the, the one thing that, um, that that struck me is kind of annoying about um, Pirates um, is when you're sailing around. I was playing on the easiest difficulty because I don't have a number pad on my keyboard. Mm-hmm. So doing a lot of the stuff's more, a lot more difficult, so I had to click. 2004, um, different time. Yeah, yeah, very different time. Those darn laptops. Okay. Um, and so I had to uh, use my mouse and made things more difficult. So um, I always kept it on the easiest difficulty. And as part of that, the wind's always blowing in one direction and one direction only. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always um, pointed uh, to the west. Um, and so if you're ever traveling east, it is painfully, painfully slow. Unless you know um, how to tack into the wind. Yeah, it helps, but it's still, it's, uh, it's terrible. <laughs> There's just um, some things you should abstract out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was, I think, a flaw of the game itself, and it was really like that from the beginning, and like Chris was saying, they had simplified some of those elements by 2004, and in a way, it kind of loses some of some of what made it, for me at least, an interesting game in the earlier versions, because they tried to do, and Sid Meier has a tendency to do this, he tries to do so much and tries to give you so much, so many, you know, little gameplay options and a, a whole bunch of freedom and openness. And, and, Spore. <coughs> yeah. Spore, Spore it was one of the ones that went way, way too far. It ended up just being, I mean, in my opinion, it wasn't even you know worth playing. It was there one was game and then a bunch of tech on. Yeah. And, and, oh, I go the other way um, with that one. I, I think they stripped too much out. Mm. Uh, the original name of it was Sim Everything. It was supposed to be the end-all, be-all simulator game that allowed you to play in the multiple styles as you wish. And by the time it but released, that, it became a a cartoon. That's because that concept that doesn't work like that. You can just do anything. That's you not can't. a concept. What? That's nonsense. But if you if you take the let's call it the library yeah. of Sim uh, Sims, <laughs> not the Sims, but you know what I mean. Maybe the, the Sims Sim too. Games, yeah. But the Sim games, the entire library of Sim games, everything you've learned from it. Um, yeah, you should be able to simulate an ant colony and as one did in Sim, Sim Ant, only better um, within the context of Spore. And originally, that's what was supposed to happen. And then basically, as I understand it, the producers basically went, uh, where's our money? Where's our game? You, yeah. you pitched E3 like three years ago. And Come it, was, on. it was EA, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I think, I, I still think that that was because I don't I don't think they could have done that concept. I think they still can. I really, I don't think they could. Because you're... Hey, No Man's Sky? It's basically just, mm. which, there's nothing to that game. Well, okay. Don't get me started. I'm going to go off on No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky. All right, but let's, let's move on. Updates, let's move yeah, on and keep on. and keep. Well, I, I had a thing to say about pirates that I didn't get to. Good. Okay. Uh, the most interesting thing after I, this. I actually found in Sid Meier's Pirates, the 2004 version. I don't know if it was present in the original. Um, how you adjust the difficulty is part of the game's mechanics. Because um, yeah, 
well, whenever as you, you split your booty, you have the lines. option to go up to yeah. the next rank in difficulty. Mm. Um, Divide the plunder is what they call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you get more rewarded for you that. Do. You get more money. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but then it starts slowly taking out elements that are like tooltips and stuff. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Showing you like which button to press during a sword fight to counter the thing and that sort of deal. So. And eventually that just disappears, and so you have to read. The- yeah, and you need a keypad. Which I no, I have. think I, <laughs> I, I do think it did some did some good things. It was it was definitely a game like like again a lot of the projects that Sid Meier does has now, a lot of experimental elements to them. Can we marry um, right, Sid so Meier's with Assassin's Creed Black Flag? No, I doubt it. Yeah, yeah. probably. I was not really. I'm not really a fan of that. I played it on PS2 though. So mm-hmm. Black Flag? No. The, <laughs> no pirates. No. <laughs> pirates. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, I didn't miss the keypad. That's yeah. my point. Mm-hmm. All right, so moving on from this this week's topic, which is apparently all about pirates now. Uh, no, so uh, so this week I played. Also played. Uh, finished a game. I finished Wolfenstein Old Blood. I know I've been talking about it some on the on the podcast. Um, it sort of takes a turn in the second act of the game. Second or third? Second act, I believe. Uh, I think there's just two. Uh, but essentially, you get to a point where um, this, you know, you think you've got the file that you're supposed to, that you're tracking down in order that's going to get you inside Death's Head Compound, which is what happens at the beginning of uh, New Order that we play. Um, and instead, there's like some sort of, a re- like one of the, there's like a, a rebel, you know, attack on uh, the little base, the little uh, base that you've infiltrated. The whole building collapses, everything is sort of in disarray. And, um,. The Nazis that are all dead get right back up again, uh, and they're zombies now. So now the rest of the game, oh, you goody. have Nazi zombies. Um, it's actually quite fun because um, I, I believe I mentioned that the zombies in, in Wolfenstein Old Blood were always presented in this very kind of over the top, cartoonishly evil way. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I think at a certain point they just decided, look, let's just let's just go even farther with mm-hmm. it, push the push it even more, and just make them into hard, like just literal monsters as opposed to metaphorical monsters. Now they're the evil dead. Now, essentially, yeah. So it's pretty fun, actually. And, and one of the cool things about it, too, is that they're not really... They're not the slow zombies or the fast zombies. They're both. So, like, they'll move really slow, and then all of a sudden they'll, like, like run really fast at you. And they'll move really slow, and all of a sudden move oh, very so fast. so they're the so, 30 days later zombies. Yeah, so it's like they kind of, like, uh, 28 days later? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, they, like, shamble. They sort of, like... So it's, it's kind of neat. They can sort of surprise you sometimes. Um, we zombies are born sprinters. <laughs> yeah. Very dangerous over short yeah. distances. <laughs> I don't know. Zombies are their own trope it, that won't die. I'm, it really helps with... Um, <laughs> that and vampires. Learning. Yeah. yeah. I thought... And I'm, I'm someone that is... I's, I've been sort of, like, burned out on zombies for a while, but I was cool with this because... They're Nazi zombies, and then also uh, and because it's Wolfenstein. I, yes, and I was I, I enjoy Wolfenstein so much. I thought it worked. Um, also, you get there's this really cool scene where you get a early on uh, you get a uh, shotgun, and you oh. yeah you get like like you find a shotgun and you you have a um, um you know, you're in like a tool area and you pull out a hacksaw and you start sawing off the end of it because you know you you're gonna fight zombies you gotta have a cool weapon to do it with so you start sawing the barrel and you're going slow and all of a sudden uh, a zombie crashes to the roof. Starts coming towards you. Look up. You look back down, and you're and you're you see BJ just start like sawing faster. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So uh, the the sawed off shotgun actually, I'm, I'm glad they they saved it until you get the zombies because it really takes them out fast. Um, it's pretty cool too because you can unlock a lot of the perks uh, if you had missed them in the game pretty quickly because zombies just uh, essentially they'll just keep respawning in an area. They like, fall from they like literally they're falling from the sky. You have like zombie <laughs> meteors falling from the sky, crashing and getting up and coming after you. It's really <laughs> weird. Um then for the ending, which I gotta say um I'm not really a huge fan of, they kind of went the old the whole um let's have a giant beast fight and you have to like fight it sort of in stages and it sort of goes against the the it's a, as opposed to having like mechanized monsters there's this giant golem that just sort of you have to kind of like uh dodge it's like big giant hands and crashing arms and all that and then shoot it as other zombies come after you um i don't know i felt it kind of broke from the rest of the game at least some of the skills that you may have learned uh but all in all i enjoyed the game um there's this moment at the end where you're going after uh, I believe her name is Helga, the mm-hmm. one girl that the woman, one of the evil female Nazis, who you were trying to get. She was like one of the right hand uh, women, I guess, of um, Deathhead. And uh, there's this one moment where you go into a room and you see her. She's like really hurt from the Golem attack, and you can take the Manila folder from her. And you don't have to kill her, but you can. So it's kind of an interesting thing where you could just kind of leave her there, where she's like really injured, and maybe she'll die anyway. I don't know. Or you can just shoot her. Um, I mean, I shot her because I was just like, hey, can I shoot her? And then I did. 
But um, I thought it was kind of interesting that they just kind of let give you that choice, and it's never really like there's not a screen that pops up and says, "Do you want to kill Helga?" There's not. It's nothing like that. It's literally just in the game. You can either pull your gun out and shoot, or, or just walk. Paragon, renegade. Paragon, yes, it's, renegade. None, it's none of that. And so I appreciated that they just sort of give you an organic choice as opposed to a forced moment where it's like thrust upon you. Now is the time to make a choice. Mm. Mm. So, organic. Yeah. Uh, it's really neat, though. So I don't know. I know y'all haven't played um, Old Blood, but um, I would recommend checking it out if you're a fan of like uh, old style um, FPSs. It's really it's really neat too, because uh, at one point throughout most of the game, you uh, since you sort of busted out of prison, you you weren't wearing a shirt for the whole game. Like you were just you were just like it, it becomes a joke, a running joke later on. <laughs> Um, I'm just like hearing 80 synth pop in my head right now. Yeah, <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> it, it, it works. So yeah, like they they even make a point of of like pointing it out that you're just like you're basically just like this crazy like like super muscled American running around in in, in Nazi Germany you without your say, shirt yeah. on, you like just say you're killing a, a hordes of Americans. <laughs> yeah, yes, you are a real American. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, it's a it's a game I definitely would recommend. Um, and I know not none of y'all have played it, so I won't dwell on it too much. Um, so, Doc, what have you been playing lately? Well, it's been a little while since I actually picked it up, but um, I want to I want to mention it because it actually is another one of those games that hit the um, PlayStation Plus subscribers, and, and that's Don't Starve. And so, um, I like Don't Starve. I think it's a, a game that you can plan to spend... Um, 20 minutes to an hour on. Mm-hmm. And what well, what kind of game is it? Well, way, it's a survival game. Okay. Um, top down. Yeah, it's it's kind of well, not really top down actually. It's, it's isometric. It's, really. Yeah, it's isometric. Okay. But uh, but I love the art style. The art style is very much like um, a Tim Burton film. Yeah, that's really? a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. Actually, what it reminds that's me cool. of is the card game Grim, mm. um, which mm. no, it was Gloom that we played. Gloom. Sorry. Yes, Gloom. Um, which uh, we'll definitely need to talk about in a in a future podcast. But um, what what I like about the game is it's pretty randomly generated. The maps are pretty randomly generated, but you can do things like capture rabbits and you can build walls and you can make fires and it's, make friends. Yeah, <laughs> you can. You can also get eaten by terrible creatures. You can um, also eat friends. But I think the best part about it is, well, of course, you can starve and die, which is the title mechanic. Uh, the best part is actually you can also go crazy. Hmm. And if you go crazy, stuff starts appearing. And, and then you. it can eat you. So stuff starts appearing, but it's not in well, your head. It's actually things that are... Appearing. There are thresholds. There's like... I think the, the threshold where st- stuff starts appearing is like half your sanity. It's been a while since yeah, I played. Yeah, they're like little shadows. And, and then stuff. eventually those shadows start getting darker and have physical form. Um, and then they'll start attacking you. Exactly. And as you hit them, uh, it, it, as you kill them, you gain sanity back just a little bit, just to keep you over the threshold. There's a there's a humor to it that is fantastic. Like, the first time you look down a rabbit hole, it says, that's where the bunny people live. Hmm. And, and you're like, what does that even mean? I, I have no idea. Actually, every character has a different set of right. descriptions. But the first time, the first time, uh, the first character... With well, that's assuming you do it with the first character. And that's actually a good point, is you unlock characters the, the longer you survive, and you gain XP and that kind of a thing. And, and you have fun things. Like, one of my favorite characters is a little girl who, when she gets scared, she, she starts fires. Like, with her mind. I know, I think she, she just does that. I don't think, I think you have to be hit, does it? I, or, I don't remember. I do remember my favorite character was the librarian because I don't have to build a, a science machine. I just have all the recipes right now. Yeah, that's true. That was a good one. Um, but in, in a sense, it feels a little bit like Minecraft. Mm. Mm. Except you don't build anything Minecraft style. And you don't oh, see so it's videos. more of a game. It's Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's crafting. Um, and there's, there's a crafting tree and there's unlockable recipes and all of that stuff. But um, it's, really, it's really more than anything... A roguelike, mm, mm, makes and sense. Yeah. Not not in the dungeon crawl sense, but in the how am I going to do it this time mm-hmm. sense. Procedurally generated. Yeah, exactly. And I assume that once you die, it's it's done. You have yeah, to start pretty over. much. Okay. Um, my best run ever ended whenever I built this really fantastic little um, wooden fortress, and then it randomly got hit by lightning <laughs> because I had not built a lightning rod. And they're uh, so easy to build too. I know, um, and it's just something I had overlooked, and so because of that, um, 
and, and the lightning's pretty random too. But mm-hmm. um, it mm-hmm. the whole thing just burned down. I caught fire. I was running around screaming, and it just I, I ended up getting killed by a penguin, That's which cool. is so random. <laughs> yeah, so, the penguins are terrible. Yeah, so but, how long how long <laughs> does a normal session last in terms of like your survivability? Well, like, is it like a twenty depend- minute kind of thing? As you, get, as you get better, yeah. But your first one, ten minutes. Two an hour. It depends. Yeah, twenty minutes. Depends maybe. on how many roguelikes you've played before. Yeah. Uh, but that's funny thing is, I, I'm not, not even really wanting to talk about that that original version uh, as much as I am about the Giants edition, which is the expansion. It's a load of new content. So some people may actually have played the game and know the game and not realize that there's been a huge expansion that has come out now. Which, if you have PS Plus, is completely free to download. It's also cross platform. So if you pick it up. For uh, one platform, you can play it on PS4 as well, which is fantastic. So, uh, highly recommend it. I was a part of the beta for the multiplayer, and that is a don't starve together world <laughs> of fun as well. Don't starve together is a cool game too. But I'm not going to even talk about that because hmm. um, right now, what's what's free and available and should get you hooked is uh, the don't starve that is out. So cool. There you go. That's good. The thing well, about Ducks, uh, um, Don't Star I Love more than Minecraft is I don't have to listen to the kids at camp talk about YouTube le- uh, Let's Players. There we go. Yeah, mm. All right. There we go. Um, it's a plus. Mm. So, yeah, it's a plus. Brian, is there a game you'd like to talk about? <laughs> um, oh, well, uh, I played a game that I don't usually play. It's a kind of genre that I've never really gotten into, but mm. I thoroughly enjoy playing um, Freedom Planet. Um, which is a basically a big love letter to Genesis era uh, Sonic games. Um, anthropomorphic creatures run real fast through nice platforming stages. Um, mm-hmm. Really, that's really, on Steam, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was a PC PC mm. game. I was always so terrible at Sonic games. Uh, I'm not too yeah. good at it, but um, there isn't so much there there aren't a whole lot of points where like you need to have precision platforming or you need to develop really expert level skills to get through the levels mm-hmm. but developing those skills lets you get you know speed running secrets treasure all that kind of should thing should we have our controller out when we play it uh yeah probably okay oh i would never want i playing a platformer without a controller just feels wrong kind of like how it's taken me so long to get used to playing an fps with a controller because it just feels imprecise compared well, I to play a mouse cave keyboard, story with but... a keyboard and mouse so really oh well, mostly the keyboard Actually, all keyboard. I, I mean, I used to play emulators sometimes with it before I started using controllers, and it just it always felt wrong to me. See, yeah. I always I played PC before I got a console, so I grew up with keyboard before I knew what a controller was. Oh, I I grew up with them both concurrently. I had a bunch of DOS games, and then I also had um, the NES. So sorry, Brian. I did <laughs> both. Okay. <laughs> this week in gaming history. Uh, I'd like to do a quick segment uh, this week in gaming history because we do have uh, something that did occur, uh, at least uh, specifically today, which is we're recording this on July 15th. Um, in 1983, the Famicom, which was uh, also known as the Family Computer, later in the U.S. it was the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, the Famicom launched in Japan on this day in 1983. Wow. And it launched with um, only three launch titles. It probably wouldn't have been very successful if it launched with these games in the U.S., but it didn't. Um, it launched with arcade ports of Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye, which were all designed by Nintendo. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, it... Of course, it took it another two years before it got to the U.S., and by that time, they had a whole bunch of new games, including Super Mario Bros., which was you know came out in 1985, but for, from the U.S. perspective, it launched with that game, and I think it probably wouldn't have been as successful over here had it uh, not launched with a game like Super Mario Bros. that took advantage of all the, all the, uh, all the power that that system had. Um, which was actually Mario's third game. Technically, because yes. the Mario Brothers was their second one. Yes, yes. And I was going to say, he technically was in Do- Donkey Kong Jr. as well. I think the original Donkey Kong was also... No, it was. It was Mario. No, no. Uh, the original Donkey Kong was, before it became Donkey Kong, was a Popeye game. It was, yes. In fact, I was I was going to mention that. It was, really? Well, technically, yeah. it was... it was Essentially, it was designed uh, to use the Popeye characters. Uh-huh. Um, and what happened was they just couldn't get the license for it. So they ended up developing their own characters. It actually explains a lot. Yeah. And because they developed... Yeah, exactly. You think about mm-hmm. it like like Bluto, mm-hmm. Donkey Kong, and you've got Mario as Popeye. It, mm-hmm. it, and then you've got... The barrels. Um, yeah, the barrels. You've got Pauline instead of, you know, olive oil. It makes sense. It's, you know, the comparisons make sense. But um, obviously, 
we could be this could be a very different um, discussion that we'd be having about Nintendo, or possibly wouldn't even know much about Nintendo had they not developed it on their own. Because Donkey Kong became a very not a very popular game, but it was also their own IP. So if they didn't have that IP, if it was tied to the Popeye franchise, who knows what would have happened in terms of like not just Donkey Kong's development, but obviously Mario's and Popeye, Popeye and Sonic at the Winter Olympics. Yeah. Well, but see, they would never, they did never actually own the rights to Popeye. They just had, they just you know, they licensed the IP. You know what would have happened? So. More kids would have eaten their spinach, and we wouldn't have the obesity epidemic in America that we have today. Yeah. Oh, what a terrible man. future! Spinach instead of magic <laughs> mushrooms, right? All right, so uh, uh, moving along. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. A few days ago, on July 11th, the current uh, president of Nintendo, uh, Satoru Iwata, died from bile duct cancer, uh, which is kind of strange because he seemed actually pretty healthy not too long ago. Yeah, he was only like, what, 55? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. That's crazy. So um, he was, for those that that do not know, um, he was actually the first Nintendo president that was not part of the Yamauchi um, Hiroshi Yamauchi who was the previous president before him. Mm-hmm. Um, his family had started the company, and it, of course, it's been a, a company that's been around for kind about a hundred years. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was originally a trading card company, and um, and not to be confused with Nintendo of America because that is yes, correct. A cool not different to, not to be confused. We're talking yeah. about Nintendo and um, the, the original the Nintendo company that is still around in Japan today. And it, he was the first president that was not part of that family, so it was sort of a, a, a groundbreaking. Uh, move in and of itself. He started out as a programmer um, for Nintendo and also for um, HAL Labs. So he worked on games like Balloon Fight on the uh, NES. It's sort of like Joust, Ooh, if yeah. y'all had played that game. It's pretty neat. Um, he also helped uh, either working as a programmer or being like a you know a director, producer. Worked on games like Super Smash Brothers, Kirby, Pokemon, Earthbound. A lot of these, a lot of these are you know HAL Lab games. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he had a lot of, of influence on game development, early games. He also, when he became president in 2002, um, he sort of directed the company in the new direction with their Blue Ocean strategy when they were trying to get a lot of new people to come in and uh, be gamers and start playing video games. And so he directed the development of the DS and the Wii, which were both very successful systems and took Nintendo back into uh, you know financial solvency and got them well in the black. And one of the reasons why they can be Secure with the, uh, the the very lukewarm success or non-success of the uh, Wii U because they had so much money from left over from the Wii that did extremely well. well I've been seeing reports that um, when they started going fi- into financial trouble, he cut his salary in half. Yeah. So that people didn't get have to really get laid off. Yeah. In fact, um, he he was actually very big into. Um, being sort of like you know, helping the people in his company because I mean he came from such a low, a lowly position. I guess he understood where they were coming from, and uh, uh, I believe I didn't write this one down, but um, he did have a, a quote where he talked about um, he doesn't think that people can be you know game developers can be creative if they're worried about losing their job or if they have their salary cut and they mm-hmm. can't you know they can't support themselves or support their families. There's something to that. Yeah, I, I really do think there is, and so because. You know, if you if you can't even support yourself, you're not you're going to be thinking about where am I going to get food? How am I going to make ends meet? You're not going to be trying. And be yeah, all you're worried about is just making the sale, not making the game. Precisely. Yeah. So he was. You he, yourself. <laughs> so he was. I mean, I, I, you really have to respect him for for the stuff that he did. Um, I do have this one quote that I know it's been going around a lot, but I did want to mention it because I think it's my favorite quote from him. Um, I am and always will be your friend. Uh, well, I, I, he probably said that at some point. Oh. Uh, no, it was, uh, he said, on my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer, but in my heart, I am a gamer. Nice. And that's just something that sometimes we, I think, a lot of presidents of companies, uh, companies like EA, Activision, uh, Konami, um, hmm. these companies that the presidents and the ones in charge are just basically their executives are looking for money. They're not really gamers. They're, they're, they're businessmen. And he was a businessman, but he was also a gamer. And he was also a game developer, and he had been a programmer. And I do think that that kind of... That that base gave Nintendo, and still does give Nintendo, this different sort of feel. You know, they're out there, they're trying to produce games that are um, fun and interesting, and that people are... They're, they're doing it from a consumer side first. So, I understand that some people are not the biggest fan of some of the direction that Nintendo is going, but... I grew up a Nintendo fan, and I, I will hey, always I'm be one. Hey, I'm a Nintendo one. fan. <laughs> Here back, we're compatible. We're pro Nintendo. Yes. 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 So I would like to, um, you know, just, uh, I guess, dedicate the episode to, you know, Awada, and, and obviously, I'm sure his 
Um, his family has a lot to go through right now, but mm-hmm. it is something that I know that um, the game industry sort of all came together to yeah. mention. It was mention very, him. Yeah. It was very positive. Mm-hmm. All, all, all the different companies, Sony, uh, Microsoft. All, all um, had a little tribute. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's very nice. Um, everyone sort of like, there was a ceasefire on the uh, console wars for a while. <laughs> Now it's time for Let's Watch Let's Plays, the part of our show about games, about shows about games. Well, you know, I briefly mentioned um, Watch It Played last week, and I I just felt like I needed to give a little bit more information about that, because um, I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody had a chance to really look. The, the guy who runs it, his name is Rodney Smith, and I couldn't remember that last time. Um, but he's actually been doing this since about 2011. And his original idea was just, uh, I'm going to put a game on the table, and then in the comments section, you can say what it is the next move should be. And it actually took a, a weird turn in that it was wildly popular. And he did this for Mansions of Madness, was his first one. Mm. Um, and then the next one was Wrath of the Shardalon, which is where I picked up on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the neat thing about it is he's got some videos which are just rules explanations and nothing else. And then he's got some that are the, the gameplay. And it turns out that some of the companies, especially the smaller companies, not Fantasy Flight necessarily, but uh, some of the smaller ones, have actually used his videos as the official... Um, rules explanations because he does it so well. So again, shout out to him. Also, I think last year I implied that he was a dirty American um, from the north, and in fact he is a dirty Canadian from even further north. So, uh, oh, um, Canuck. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I wanted to get that information correct because uh, I feel odd and out of place being from California. <laughs> well, there you go. Get out of here. <laughs> okay. Don't mind leaving Texas. <laughs> also, a fun fact, uh, he was actually the Geek of the Week in two thousand uh, January of 2013 on uh, BoardGameGeek.com. Mm-hmm. So, there you go. Cool. So, once again, that website that you can go to uh, to see all of his stuff is watch-it-played.com mm. um, or go to uh, YouTube slash uh, user slash Watch It Played. Cool. All one word. Yeah, cool. And I know, Doc, you also uh, mentioned that you wanted to discuss uh, Lego World. Oh, Talk a little man. Bit about that. I know you're a big Lego, you went Lego there. guy. You went there. Yeah, you know, um, I, 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 I spend a lot of my fun money on Lego. I do. What I don't spend on games, I probably spend on Lego. Um, or Lego games. Well, those two. <laughs> and in fact, I think I've said in the past that one of my favorite games is the uh, Lego Lord of the Rings series, because as a transmedia guy and a transmedia <laughs> scholar it is a game that is based on a toy that is based on a movie that is based on a book that is based on a world um, based on you know this uh, crazy new genre called fantasy and you know as the first entry I think Tolkien nailed it because everything else is a pastiche but um the amazing thing about Lego Worlds that no other Lego game has done is as as a game scholar, I subscribe to the Bartle test of games. You guys are familiar with this one? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the one where uh, you you get on and you take the, the tests, right? And the test is uh, you score one of four things. It was originally for MMOs, but it's kind of been adapted into general... Well, technically it's still from, from MMOs. It was a 1996 paper by Richard Bartle, right? And then in 99-2000, uh, two guys, uh, Andreasen and Downey, uh, took it and actually made the test that he sort of proposed. So... Killers, achievers, socializers, and explorers are the four different metrics. Metrics? Metrics. Metrics. Um, And it's on a two-by-two. So you can actually get 200% whenever you add up your score. When I take this thing, I end up like 90% explorer. Lego Worlds is made for the explorers. Um, I I have often said that there is uh, three type of of Lego fans. The type who like to dump the big pile of Legos in the floor and build something. The type who like to follow the instructions and um, build the thing that is in the instructions. And then those who slog through that so that they can display their Lego. Um, I guess I'm the latter two. Um, I probably could make a giant pile of Lego, but it would t- 
terrify me to do so because I would never then be able to find the pieces that I needed in order to follow the instructions and display my my Lego. So um, the the actual term is adult fan of Lego, AFOL, which is awful, yeah. which is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, there's advanced Lego techniques that have been incorporated in some of the more recent Lego builds, uh, such as um, studs not on top or snot, which is something that uh, the MOCs, uh, which is the um, you know our own creation basically, it it's it's amazing. There's a whole culture or subculture about just Lego like that. This game, unlike the other stuff that has come before, is about that. It's not yet a MMO. It's on early release. If you remember the early, early days of Minecraft, which I guess is an unavoidable comparison, um, you remember that it was a single-player thing, and it actually kind of took Notch and Company by surprise that people were interested in playing multiplayer, and so they shifted their focus over into multiplayer. It was really unstable back in Alpha. I don't know if any of you guys actually played it back then. or A little bit, at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we got in on Alpha. We had an Alpha server uh, like within the week that it was available. And it was just insane um, how quickly the updates came and how involved we were all able to be in you know, making changes and, and discussions and, and things like that. So I think it's absolutely brilliant for LEGO to finally get in on this, but do it at the time when they are able to do it right. And so what you've got is this random world generation that doesn't focus on the little bits of pulling a piece of Lego out and building a new thing, though you can do that. It's about discovering pre-built stuff, adding it to your personal collection, and then whenever you get uh, enough in-game currency to be able to unlock it or um, build it, once you've done that, then you can throw it down. And if you've discovered a plane somewhere, then you can be in that plane. And it's worth fly. it's worth mentioning, too, this is actually a lot like the other LEGO games that have been coming out. Um, Traveler's Tales, the developers of all those, are developing this. So yeah. that currency you mentioned that's is true. studs. So you basically blow yeah. things up that are LEGO. You get the yeah. studs. And you build and that's always things. been true. I, yeah. I like the Star Wars LEGOs, and the, mm-hmm. I, I mentioned the, the Lord of the Rings ones, and that's mm-hmm. basically the way that that has always worked. Mm-hmm. As you take something down, and it, it becomes little studs. The blue ones are worth a 1000 which mm-hmm. is amazing, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so I've actually been watching it on... Um, one of my favorite uh, YouTubers' channels, uh, which is Yogg's Cast Shin, S-J-I-N. So I recommend looking at his Let's Play. Uh, he found a fire-breathing dragon and some other cool stuff, and uh, minotaurs and whatnot. And so um, I think that this is the game to watch. It's like... On Steam, it's like sixteen bucks or fifteen bucks early access for early yeah. access. And I'll, I'll say, like, I've played a little bit of it myself. And the thing that kind of bugs me, kind of that, the explorer thing, the idea that you're exploring the world and that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm not a huge fan of the draw distance because I don't feel like I'm exploring when I can't see more than however many yards in front of me. Sure, I want to be able to see like there's the horizon. There looks like there's something cool there. I want to go to it. You it'll know? it'll yeah. get fixed. I'm, I'm hoping it does yeah. because right now it's like uh, not not digging it. But. That would bug me too. I didn't realize. I mean, I. It's. I'm the sort of person I gotta wait until a game comes out. I don't really believe in early access, so I'll wait until it comes out if I'm gonna check it out. But um, that would really bug me too. So hopefully that's something that is fixed upon actual release. You know, there were other Lego games that came before Star Wars and all those. Yeah, there were. My first Lego game on the computer was Lego Rock Raiders. Rock Raiders was cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was an RTS. I think mine was Racers. Yeah. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Too, yeah, Racers was awesome. Yeah. So, it, it's a very different era for Lego games, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All but right. It's just cool because they've got all those models now, so basically all they have to do is just port them over. Yeah. You know, anything from any Lego game ever is fair game. Yep. Mm-hmm. Now, can we combine Lego for, uh, Lego and for Warhammer 40K and then just suck money out of the world? Just because you can doesn't mean you should, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Would you think of the Would children. you buy Lego Space Marines <laughs> or Orcs? Totally in mm-hmm. a heartbeat. Yeah, I, I honestly wouldn't think that the um, should I have Lego. Orcs? I, I I just don't know if there's enough of an overlap between the two uh, fan bases. It's about people to... buying tiny pieces of plastic for <laughs> worth thousands of dollars in the end. <laughs> <laughs> and now the official one tweet RPG of the week. I run a Twitter account called One Tweet RPGs. It's at One Tweet RPGs. Who would have guessed? Um, and the idea is that it's, uh, it's it has tabletop role playing games and 140 characters or fewer. 
Uh, the idea is that I take the space of one tweet to essentially get across a role playing game that you can play. Um, you know, usually sort of like one shot ready, that sort of thing. But you know, in general, sort of light role playing games that you can play with friends. And I also encourage people if you're interested to um, submit your own. You might get retweeted by the accounts and maybe even featured here. Um, so the one tweet RPG of the week this week is um, one that I just recently put up um, a couple days ago. Um, Basically, what the tweet says is freestyle, in this case meaning that you sort of pick the setting, you pick how you build your characters yourself. Um, each PC has a role acting within it, or acting, yeah, acting within it. Roll a d6. Um, if you roll 3 to 6, it's a success. Outside of your roll, a 5 or a 6 is a success. Or instead, be a jack of all trades and always try to get a 4 through 6. This is actually something I drew inspiration from um, when we played Everyone is John. Um, the idea that you just got 1d6, and essentially, if you're doing something that's within your skill set, you have a 4 to or um, a 3 to 6 range succeeds, which is basically two thirds uh, chance. And if it's something that you're not very good at, it's um, a one-third chance of success. And I also just add basically the 50-50 character. So really simple, elegant way if you're just playing a role-playing game and you want to just tell, tell the story. Um, on any given thing you're doing, if it fits your role, then you can um, have a better chance of success and vice versa. So that's the One Tweet RPG of the week. Nice. Cool. One Tweet RPG. All right. So they can hopefully, some people will go out, they'll check out the, the, the Twitter and join in. Now, yep. is, is the one spelled out, or is it a numeral? It's one spelled out, yes. So O-N-E-T-W-E. Mm. Okay, good. Mm. Oh, I thought it was W-O-N. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. Um, we will occasionally retweet Keep your them. your homonyms to yourself. <laughs> yeah. We'll occasionally retweet them on Backward Compatible, so you can find it that way, too. Yeah. Nice. All right, well, Brian, the reason that we did bring you on today... Oh, uh, there was a reason. There was a reason. It wasn't to talk about Freedom Planet, and it wasn't to argue with me about pirates. Um, we no, can still do that if we, you want. We could still do that, yes. Uh, no, actually, we brought you on because um, I know you know a lot about um, different RPG systems, including some of the more oddball, uh, strange, out-there RPG systems, yeah. and uh, we wanted you to come on and talk to us about them. Uh, well, the reason why I know about all these things is because I find them interesting and Sometimes I'm terrible with my money and buy them if they're cheap and mm-hmm. have a PDF. Um, mostly, mostly my interest in them is from a stance that when I got into RPGs, I started with Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition, and I thought it was the greatest game really? I had ever discovered. <laughs> and then I realized, wait, wait was, a- was that sarcasm? No, I, I really thought it was great. <laughs> and then I realized. Oh, I never heard of this one. What is it? Do? Oh. <laughs> and then I discovered a whole world of just different things that were so much better for my play style. Yep. Was that sarcasm? No. Okay. <laughs> so I, Sorry, I, I have to stand up for fourth edition just a little bit, just because... It's okay. You know, I had a chapter in, in D&D and philosophy, and, and I defended it. Class. I defended it. It. It's not a bad system. I didn't, I didn't really like fourth edition, personally. I felt it was a little too focused on trying to interact with their, you know, board game setup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I just, it just felt like it was, like, too simplified for what it was, and, but, and you lost a lot of the, like, freedom that you sure. had. In well, that's exactly other. what they did. I just don't dig 4th edition because I just don't dig D&D in general. Um, yeah, I'm not really a huge we, we've, fan. We probably, yeah. without getting too much Lord of the Rings it. pastiche, right? Yeah. I've well, started yeah. moving away from Dungeons and Dragons. It's like, I, I totally respect it for its history, and I definitely understand why people do like it, and they like to play these really long campaigns and with it and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. I find that just those campaigns tend to dwell too way too much on combat and dungeon crawling yeah um and it's just it's not what appeals I'd, to me i'd RPGs. much rather play a shardalon drizzit and whatever the third one is mm-hmm. in in that adventure series the board game series yeah D D is a board game yeah. to me yeah um, okay so if that's our anchor point what are we defining then as an oddball well system if dungeon dragons is an anchor point for combat heavy focused board gaming um the opposite end would be anything that allows the players a ton of more freedom and freeform. Like what we'll be, what will it will come out? We'll, we'll have come out by now, uh, which is everyone, everyone is drawn. Yes, the first yes. one. Yeah. And everyone to be fair, drawn. that's not to say that D and D can't be free and open if you have right. the right group. Yes. And I was going to mention, but that as too, written, a lot of yeah. it is uh, is a GM. Mm-hmm. I mean, I played my first experience with um, tabletop RPGs was with D and D, and I believe it was. Um, not three five, just three. I believe is mm-hmm. that was it just called three third edition or something. Mm-hmm. It was before three five, but um, that was my first uh, in terms of like playing with a group, not playing uh, doing like online email or um, forum based RPGs, right. but actually sitting down with the group in person and playing was when I was in college playing D and D third edition, mm-hmm. and 
um, we played a very, very open version of it. So we, we really sort of, like, we the rules were there to sort of give us a guideline, and we didn't concern ourselves with trying to stick to the rules. But I understand that there that a lot of people, that would be, you know, blasphemy to not follow the rule book mm-hmm. and not pull out all of your little supplements and make sure that everything... And that's one of the things that I don't like about D&D. Is and all the splat books. And yes, there's all these little extra books and all these little extra things that you need to get with add-ons. And I like the simple, the more simple style that allows you to, to uh, afford you that freedom, like Everyone is John, that you mm-hmm. mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's another... Are there, are there some of these oddball RPGs where... Um, they give you a lot of freedom, but there's also a good bit. There's there's also a lot of rules, like backing a backing of rules that sort of like help to promote that freedom. Because some people, if you just say, um, here's you know here's like a couple of lines about what you have to do, go. Uh, so it's it can be a little intimidating, it's, especially if you're not if you're not as familiar with your group. So is there some that sort of like help guide you in terms of the oddball? Uh, yeah, and this bit. is another one that I want to play with you guys later, mm-hmm. which is uh, lasers and feelings. Oh yeah, mm. it. It, all the rules fit on one sheet of paper, um, mm-hmm. and if you, it's great for one shots because um, it takes like seconds to make a character and uh, to make an adventure. You just roll on a set of charts mm-hmm. to determine what the what the villain of the episode and what their evil plot is going to do and how to stop it. And so I, I, I love the uh, dice mechanic in that too. Super elegant, where uh, basically you pick a stat. I think it's lower numbers is feelings, higher numbers is lasers. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe your, the other way around. Your character has one number, mm-hmm. and uh, you know when they do something that is from the heart, is on instinct and guts and emotion. Yeah, um, that's feelings. You roll. You're trying to roll low. Yeah, you try to roll under your number, mm-hmm. and if it's if it's science, it's a, if it's. Uh, technical, if it's a cold logic, you're it's, trying to roll above the number, which is lasers. And so you pick your number. And so, for instance, if you're a two, um, then you're very science heavy because you have a bigger range where science will succeed and a smaller range where feelings will succeed. Um, and if you roll exactly your number, you get basically what is equivalent to a crit- critical success, which is laser feelings. <laughs> and you get to ask the GM one question about the situation they have to answer truthfully mm-hmm. or within context. So huh. yeah, that's another uh, John Harper RPG. We actually, um, one of our groups that we're in, me and Doc, um, played uh, Lady Blackbird uh, fairly recently, and that's a really cool system. Um, they kind of had like the chapter one was the official release, and I think it's meant to be kind of a springboard into a campaign if you want to play one. Um, so we did that, and we basically, I forget how many weeks we actually played that. No, what but, is, um, gosh, what it, it was like five or six at least mm-hmm. so so lady blackbird so how does that work what is lady blackbird so lady blackbird the they have a, a scenario basically set up for you and it's kind of this um steampunk like think steampunk firefly in a way oh. um the tv show okay um so you have these airships um and basically the 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 universe of the game is just this giant sky and there's kind of like uh this layer of clouds at the bottom. If you go too deep, you kind of get into like the deep sky, but it's all sky. And all the cities are basically like these little floating rocks in the sky. Um, and hmm. they actually give you prefabbed characters. You can that you can sort of figure out the system and build your own if you wanted to. But we actually really liked taking these characters because they all have um, interactions built into them where they have what's called. Um, Oh, uh, what was it? It was keys and secrets. Mm-hmm. Um, and the key, every time you do something matches your key. For example, my character um, was a petty thief and a sorcerer. Um, kind of like a low-level sorcerer. Um, and so uh, one of my keys was whenever I uh, scored a big score or I uh, found something cool or got a get big payoff, I get to mark one of my keys. And those keys eventually allow you to um, level up your skills or open up new skills, that sort of thing. And then secrets are Would things... Would you say that, that allows you to unlock new skills? Sure. <laughs> um, I see. You. Uh, and then there's also uh, secrets, which is ten- generally something that you can do uh, like once or twice a game session. Um, this kind of a special skill. Like for me, I think it was that um, I had really good dexterity. So if there was something that involved dexterity, I could re-roll it once per session or something like that. Um, and then you know, Doc, if you want to talk about your character a little bit, because our our, yeah. our two characters actually, um, Doc was the captain, I was the first mate, and so actually one of my keys mm. had to do with whenever I was influenced or did something because of Doc's character, I would get a key. Oh, so you guys like develop, designed your characters with synergy in mind so you can sort of interact. And we actually didn't design them. No, the we game, did the prefabs. Yeah, the game oh. came with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. so you didn't change them at all, so mm-hmm. it actually was set up that way from exactly. the start. Well, there's yeah. this okay. cool kind of background lore uh, about magic, and magic is, is forbidden except um, for the lords. And so 
my character actually had a magical ability. He basically had one spell that he could use once per session, and I held off using it for a long time mm -hmm. so people wouldn't know that I actually had it, mm -hmm. and then pulled stuff out of the fire every now and then to do it. So some of the members of the crew actually for a long time didn't even know that I, I could. Um, there was player knowledge, but not character knowledge, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think they've done a really great job with the hook because there's a love story that's embedded in it too. And um, the title character, Lady Blackbird, is actually an NPC. Mm -hmm. um, oh, she can be a player character. Can she? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know we, that. We just didn't have a big oh, enough for us, to For us, she was an NPC then. Right, yeah. Uh, which I'm glad it worked out that way, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't but, want to play Lady Blackbird, Doc? Well, I, I you didn't, I didn't know I had the option. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I played the I played the captain. Mm -hmm. um, and he's very much a, a sort of a mal of Firefly mm -hmm. kind of guy. Um, but the thing that I liked the most about the system was it was really easy to continue. Once we hit the limits of that um, scenario that was prefab, mm. we just kept going. It was super the, easy. The prefab scenario is basically you're trying to escort Lady Blackbird to go marry the Pirate King. Uh, Pirate King. Yeah, Pirate um, King. They, uh, they had a, an affair, essentially, and then she's leaving her husband, and basically you're smuggling her to go... Her fiancé. Her fiancé, that's right. Um, you're smuggling her to go marry the Pirate King. Um, and so along the way, you get captured by this um, Imperial um, cruiser, like basically a really giant flagship, um, and you have to escape that, and that's the first chapter. Yeah. And so once you escape it, it's basically up to you where you want to go with it. And we... Um, we kept going for a long time. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're going to use that system again for a future um, mm -hmm. role with it. Yeah. Cool. Different setting, but using Different that setting, same, but same system. Same system. Yeah. Well, so. Okay, so so getting back to some some even more oddball mm -hmm. systems because I'm I'm interested in some really weird stuff. Could you g give me one that you're like this one is like the weirdest, like so weird that maybe it's almost even too weird for you or fourteen days, fourteen days. Uh, Kickstarter just recently finished, I believe, uh, or just hit its goal. Uh, fourteen days is about playing people with chronic pr uh, pain and migraines. It is about living. <laughs> what? It's, so it's like playing with me. Well, no. <laughs> migraines are not just headaches. Uh, I know. I get migraines all the time. I'm well aware. Like, you can't move from bed migraines? I get extreme nausea and, like, eye throbbing and facial issues. Yeah. Well, 14 days is about two weeks of yeah. people with, uh, with chronic pain. And you have to balance, basically, your life, your work, and your, lo uh, your romance, your mm -hmm. romantic interests... While dealing with this unpredictable, ever looming mm -hmm. threat of just chronic headaches that will not, or chronic pain that will not yeah. leave, so no, I can basically like roll for do you have a headache today? <laughs> yeah. Sort of thing. Or, yeah, I don't, I don't get them yeah. as bad to the point where like I'm, well, rarely I get them as bad to the point where I can't get out of bed. But, but you can't predict them really. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you might have like a few triggers or cer certain things that might set them off, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that that you can one hundred percent. Okay, I'll, I'll say it. It's too weird for me. <laughs> well, so so let it's me more ask. of an empathy game. Yeah, so how does it? So okay, so but ev and everyone is in that same situation. Yeah, and so, you basically p play characters that live their lives with chronic pains. And but what do you do aside from just being chronic pain and not able to do anything? Like what? What it's is an the purpose game. of the game? The purpose of the game is to understand the condition, to understand that position in life. And so you're, you're basically playing as just normal okay. people going through their everyday lives. So it's really years. okay. So it's really meant to teach you about. Um, about the people that experience um, really bad migraines as opposed to an actual game that someone would want to play. It's a, that makes it sound bad. Well, it's it's not a game. It's more of a. It's more of like it's, it's an like, empathy tool. It's like art. It's like a tool that you're you're expected to learn something it's from. A corporate it. retreat exercise. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, and then you move on. It's like I, I mean, I could see how it would be useful to play at one time if you if you want to understand something new. But once you once you get that experience, there's no reason to go back to it, right? Because you've already experienced. Also, well, you just really found it interesting and moving on a personal level. Yeah, um, it, I, 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 could, I could see actually like if you sort of treat it as a drama generator for like a more realistic drama as opposed to a fantasy which most of us yeah, are used to playing in that. RPGs I, I, could, um, I could definitely see it as something where if I get invested in the character I want them to have a happy life mm -hmm. and I don't want them to fail against their condition Now, how does the mechanic work on it? Uh, every day, um, well for, for the two weeks you plan out uh, and a lot of time each day to um, specific categories of, of things you need to do like chores, work um, self and uh, love and, and friends and basically you slot time in each week so that you can fulfill a certain amount of hours for each one or basically a certain number of units for each one um, before each day um, 
the other player or other players, one of the other players will roll for that day. And if they roll, I think it's a five or six, or four, five, and six, you will have a migraine. Mm. And the higher the number is, the more severe it is, the more of those things that day you don't get to do Mm. or that are threatened by the migraine. Now, you all have medication. You have medication that you can take, but you need to roll a one for it to work. Ah, interesting. Mm. And... Medication has side effects, and yes, oh yeah, it doesn't always work. Mm-hmm. So, and you only have your prescription for that those two weeks. You can't get a refill, right? So it's it's interesting to see like how how you narrate your life when or or, or how your life turns out when when you're just going through your day doing what you want to do and then just have to stop. So so let me ask you this: um, Is there an element of uh, self-medication because I know that there are definitely some people that would use um, drugs and alcohol to get through or try to get through. I don't know. And I, I, I'm not, so I'm, I'm curious if there's like a, like a self-medicating element like, oh, hey, you could try this. There's like the problem of like drug addiction or or, or you know like, what I'm saying, or alcohol addiction or something like that where like... Or homemade remedies. Or homemade remedies that <laughs> might talking be, about taking yes, your prescription. Or, yes, or homemade about, remedies that are dangerous. I'm talking... Yes, exactly. Yeah, or, so, or just plain stupid like holding oil in your mouth to leach the toxins from your right, body. Right. Trying to do some sort of like strange home remedy because you're so desperate to find something that works because you... If you have them so bad that it's debilitating, you might be willing to try anything. Um, and then maybe there's like a risk of death associated with it, a risk of addiction, a risk of possibly getting even more into more pain. I don't think it gets that dark. Um, I, don't, I don't think it like... Because that I think would be actually pretty interesting to include those elements. You could always house roll it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it's, it's just, it's still on Kickstarter. It's mm-hmm. still getting funded. Um, so I don't, I haven't seen the finalized document, mm-hmm. but um, there are consequences for taking too much medication in one day, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're <laughs> you end up in the hospital bad, but it well, could be. <laughs> that's what happens in real life. You take too yeah. much medication. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of every day, um, there are a list of questions that the other player asks you about your day. Like, what is one thing that you regret not being able to do? Mm-hmm. What is one thing, or what is one thing that um, that went well for you? That mm. went unexpectedly went well for you? Mm. Um, what is some? Uh, who was it that day that? Did not understand what a migraine is and offered help that was not helpful at all. Yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, you just yeah. get bad headaches. Why don't you take a Tylenol mm-hmm. or something like that? <laughs> yeah, just take extra strength Tylenol. That'll work. No, yeah. it does. Play no, it some doesn't. nice music. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny. I don't. I don't know if there's any connection at all to this, but it actually reminds me of those video games that came out a while back called Manhunt. Yes. You remember those? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I could envision using this system in a situation like that where. You're actually um, being compelled to do stuff, and yet you're... Because in the second one especially, he broke out of an insane asylum um, in order to do this stuff. So you, 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 you twist it a little bit, and I know this is probably not the original, the author's intent, um, but you twist it from an empathy thing to kind of a, you know, being forced to do stuff against your will kind of thing. Well, I think there are RPGs already, like um, more adventure style RPGs that have elements like that, like character traits. Mm-hmm. I remember just as an example, it's not exactly that, but similar more to the 14 Days concept to when I was playing um, Necessary Evil. It's a super villain mod for Savage Worlds. Mm. And I had a character trait that basically I bought because it was a major um, downside that I used to get some major boons. Um, and it was essentially this uh, this... Um, really bad illness where I had to actually roll at the beginning of each se- um, session to see if it would affect me. And if it did, it was like this um, negative die modifier to every roll I made that oh, day. Man. Um, mm. So it's actually, it's it kind of reminded me of that when I first heard about the concept. So That's cool. Well, okay, so that's the weirdest I've ever seen. Yeah, that that does sound actually quite weird. It, kind of interesting, but um, as I said, I'm not, I, I'd, I'd love to kind of throw in all of those extra elements, really go to a dark place with it. I think that could be, I think it's That's just your play style, I think. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is, Dep- depending on my mood, yes. I can vouch for that. Yeah. <laughs> but one game I know that you wouldn't play, because I've asked you about it already, is Night Witches. Mm. Which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game based on historical events in World War II. And it's Bully Pulpit, right? Yes, both guys who did uh, fiasco, fiasco. Yes, which I believe we've talked about on the podcast before. Yes. So, and I would like to play Fiasco. Mm-hmm. That, I, that I would like to play. Yeah. I've always wanted to play. I've, I've been aware of it. Oh, I've got another one that's based on Fiasco yeah. called uh, Our Last Best Hope, which I've talked to mm-hmm. talk about. Mm-hmm. But Night Witches is, is set in World War II in uh, Soviet Russia, towards the end of the war, and the players are members of the 588th Reg- uh, Air Regiment, mm-hmm. which were 
all women. From from the mechanics to the highest ranking officers, they were all women. Mm -hmm. And they faced incredible sexism, incredible odds, and came out of it um, stronger than ever. Using um, World War One era planes and World War Two. Yeah. So this, they had biplanes. This yeah. is basically like the, the Soviet version of A League of Their Own, right? Is that totally I am not familiar with that. No. No no one has seen that movie. Can no. I get to the joke? I don't know. Oh, I, I get it. Oh, okay. I just didn't think it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's it's about playing these women who during the day uh, rest and repair their planes and mm. during the night run harassment bombing campaigns against the Nazis. Yeah, it actually sounds really cool when I heard the concept. I'm I'm intrigued by games that have sort of like prescripted settings. Um, especially when they're interesting ones. Mm -hmm. Um or rather not not so much prescripted settings so much as like a, an implied prescripted story, like yes. a narrative yeah. that you expect to play out, and like it's it's good for sort of short term campaigns. It's not something you yeah. want to do like forever, obviously. Yeah, yeah you can, you can play this for the entire length of the war, mm -hmm. or for for the entire length that the regiment was around, which I think was a thousand and a hundred, one thousand one hundred days mm -hmm. of active duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just it seems so specific to me that I, I would have trouble getting into it because it just feels like. It's not about you, the war specific. Well, I mean, the war no, is there. It, it's about it's it is about, about these characters specifically, and these their specific, very specific historical. During the night, it is them. about the war. During the night, yeah. it's about running missions, bombing targets, and getting shot at by anti aircraft. Mm. But during the day, is about personal connections. As I was flipping through it, though, I was surprised. And maybe no, surprise mm. is not the right word, uh, but um, to discover that there are some LGBT yeah style um, themes, shall we say. That is a, a consideration in the game. Like the game specific, or the document specifically says, like this game uh, talks about gender issues and and uh, gender yeah gender issues in the time of war, and that is something that we know that people might not be comfortable with in their role playing game. So you don't have to if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And the same with the, the adult stuff, because some people don't play RPGs to get into like really deep. Philosophical or cultural societal yeah. issues, yeah. But it is there and available for people. Yeah, it's like I, I know that when I play RPGs, I tend to go um, Jack Bauer, silly or fantasy or something. Just like it's it's weird because I I really like move like I really like films that are very serious and very dramatic. But when I do RPGs, I like to go silly with it. So that's why I would really have a lot of trouble with this. Like I said, it just feels like it feels like it would make an excellent movie. But playing it, it just feels like it just doesn't interest me as much because it just feels like such a prescribed setting, prescribed characters, mm -hmm. situations that really I mean I wouldn't say they're necessarily all prescribed, but they're they're things that are that you would expect to happen within mm -hmm. this this setting. It just feels very. Uh, very droll, I guess. Well, I, I think, though, like, on, on the other hand, like I said earlier, I think it intrigues me because it's a very specific setting that I never would have thought of. And so I think that's interesting to kind of have, like, this sort of seed for a, a, a drama and adventure that you can play out um, that is very different from anything else mm -hmm. I've heard of in role-playing games. Yeah. So. I, no, I, I find I, it I interesting, that. and I want to uh, play it because it is something that I haven't personally experienced. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not something that I would have thought of or or in my own hmm. normal lifestyle have experienced myself. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that I would like to run one day. I'd be willing to run, I'd be willing to play it if all of us have to have to speak in falsetto during the game. Uh, and a Russian accent. No. And a Russian accent. <laughs> falsetto Russian accent. If we're all playing female characters, then we should... Or, there can be deep-voiced women. Especially in Russia. Oh, see? Man, are see? we going to be racist to ancestors? Yes, yeah, <laughs> racist to ancestors. Listen... <laughs> I, did I don't a, care. I did a kidding, shout course, out for man. LGBT. I did a shout out for <laughs> yeah. sexism. You can't expect me to. A shout out, out for sexism. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I mean? Support <laughs> sexism today. We're sp we're sticking up for the rights of, of of comedians and humor as well. So there we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, no, but it does like the story does actually sound interesting. So it could be something that would possibly be interesting to play for like a one shot or something like that. I certainly wouldn't want to play it for an extended period. I just feel like there's not. It feels like it would get repetitive in terms of what you do. Well, yes and no. Because you have a specific job, you have a specific task that you're supposed to be doing. The missions you run are different, though. Now, I was intrigued by that mark system you mentioned earlier. Could you explain that a little bit? What, what system? The the mark system. And oh, the mark system. Uh, every character has a list of marks. Mm -hmm. um, and during the horrors of war... Everyone is marked? Everyone is marked. Oh, <laughs> oh every, not everyone is marks? It, the scars uh, and trials of war leave. Phys <laughs> yeah. The scars and trials of war leave physical I'm marks so sorry, on the characters, <laughs> um, and because it's powered up by the apocalypse, um, there are 
your actions in game are called moves, and they have specific mm-hmm. uh, outcomes based on how you roll. Uh, the game that you guys might recognize more easily from that same system is Dungeon, Dungeon World. World. Yeah. Uh, oh. And Apocalypse oh. World. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Apocalypse World yeah. came first. Dungeon World is based on that. Yeah. Yeah. And everything else came after. Anyway, uh, marks are uh, the each character list, each specific character type. They have natures mm-hmm. have a certain list of marks. And as you play them, um, bad things will happen. And your characters will be marked. When you choose a mark, it will say what will happen to your character, and that will come out to be true in the narrative. Mm -hmm. And when you run out of marks, the last mark you have is Embrace Death. Mm -hmm. And so um, some of them are like Witness the Death of a Lover or uh, or of a fellow wingman or wingwoman. Um... uh, Tell a, a story from the war, um, receive a promotion in advance, um, and so other things like that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So it's a way of kind of steering the story in kind of a appropriate way, in, in sort of a of a, a, a self sacrifice, mm-hmm. um, embracing death kind of way. Yeah, cool. Hmm. Yeah, and there are moves that each uh, some characters have which allow to remove marks from other characters. Hmm. Um, I think there's one called transcendent love. Where you choose a, a character who is a lo- uh, who is your lover, mm-hmm. and when they would otherwise mark themselves for death, mm-hmm. erase all the marks for them. Oh, cool! I imagine though that'd be at a cost, though, right? I think it. You can only do it once. Mm-hmm. I think. I think, and I think you also have to be in a life or death situation yourself as well. Okay. Um, you have to be there present. Mm-hmm. Basically, you're their co pilot, and it's going down. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's one of the new systems I've, I've run across recently. That how, how, I'm, I'm sorry, Mika. How, how new is that system? Um, very new. Was it's it, fairly it new, like yeah. just come out? Uh, within the last two months. And was that also kickstarted? Or was that... Yes, I think so. It was? Okay. Another one that was kickstarted that I'm excited to, to get my physical copy in a few months is Ryutama. I might have mentioned this to you before. I don't, I don't think so. Ryu, Ryutama? Ryutama. Uh, it's Japanese system. Japanese, okay. Is there an IP attached to it? No. Really? Uh, it's... Uh, it translates literally to dragon's egg. Okay. And it oh, is okay. about... It's not about being big heroes in a fantasy setting defeating the e- great evil that plagues the land. It's about being people who just take journeys. And the and the adventure is within the journey, not the destination. Since uh, in Ryutama, the setting is pretty much um, de- uh, developed by the players. Um, there are a few constants, but the world is unmapped, okay. so to speak. And... When people reach, or when people come of age in this world, um, they develop a lust for for journeying and adventure. And they, they just develop wanderlust, and they form parties and just go on and have a journey. Mm-hmm. And it's the closest an RPG system has come to being a Ghibli movie that I've ever seen. <laughs> really, <laughs> that yeah. sounds actually really interesting. It's really cute. Hmm. Like like it's it's about it's, it. There are more systems in place in the game to deal with. Your your health and condition on the road than there are for combat. Nice. Hmm. Uh, it's more about dealing with the elements and terrain and um, learning to, to 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 survive the wilderness, so to speak, uh, than it is about fighting monsters. I mean, there are fun monsters hmm. to fight, but they aren't the sole focus of the game. Sure. Yeah. So is this is this a um Japanese in terms of style and culture, or in terms of it was developed by? It was written by a Japan, Japan, or both. It was written in Japan, and it has. It, it mixes. It's a blend of a lot of Japanese cultural uh, um, elements, but there are also like Western ideas as well. Um, uh, Is it supposed to be set in? Um, you said it's fantasy, right? Yeah, the, so it's the, kind of like medieval era ish. Sort of, yeah. Okay, yeah. There's magic. Does uh, it feel JRPGs? But yeah, is it, is it Japanese medieval era or is it? it no, no, it's European. It, it's a little of both. There, okay. There's a little of both. Um, and I would say that the combat does feel very JRPG ish. Mm. Uh, there, there's a, a very specific battle system that feels like a JRPG, but it's not so overt. I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting, I feel, is what's, what's most interesting is that DMPCs are a thing, right? I mean, D and D has always had that DM oh, character yeah. that no one likes and <laughs> takes all the glory and is just a jerk and is like twenty levels higher than the rest of the party. Mm. The babysitter. The, yes. Well, Ryutama has a built-in DMPC and specific rules for what they can do with the party. Mm-hmm. In 
they're what call, they are what are they are what are, the, 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 the DMPC is what's called a Ryujin, a dragon person, hmm. um, and they're they serve one of the four seasonal dragons that created the world originally, and these dragons they they serve um, the offspring, the, the the younger dragons, hmm. and um, what they do to serve them is feed them stories. You hmm. can't just make up a story to tell a dragon; you have to go out and find one. So, Ryujin travel out into the world and find parties of adventurers about to set out on their journey, mm. and then just sort of watch from the sidelines. They, they'll, they'll give help when necessary, mm-hmm. but usually, more often than not, they want the story to be interesting, so they want help to the point of just giving them the, the victory. Yeah, yeah. They want things to be challenging and interesting and overcome personal hardships, mm-hmm. which makes a good story. That's super cool. Yeah. Uh, and based on which dragon, which seasonal dragon you serve, uh, spring, summer, autumn, or fall or winter, mm-hmm. uh, you get different powers and abilities, and it sets a different focus for the story. Mm-hmm. Um, spring dragon, spring Ryujin focus more; they're more of a balanced play, uh, balanced storytelling style, mm-hmm. where it's about it's better recommended for uh, first time players of Ryutama. Um, summer. Dragons are more about combat and war focused, mm-hmm. and their abilities are more tied to resurrecting fallen party members and giving bonuses in combat. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can't remember what autumn is. Autumn, I think, is more um, about autonomy. No, more about yes. drama, more interpersonal drama and That's relationships, uh, mm-hmm. love, romance, and rivalries. Mm-hmm. Um, and winter is interesting. It's more about direct confrontation no indirect conversation with backstabbing betrayal and dark dark secrets i figure it would probably be something to have to do with like darkness and like darker themes yeah it, uh, the the uh the winter region have powers that um are more directly focused on hindering the players or making oh, relationships worse huh. but hmm. it's not recommended for first time so players. more more the uh not not even just like not helpful, but like meddling Ryujin. Yeah, interesting. And the troll Ryujin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's overall Ryutama's like super cute and adorable, and it's it's one of the RPGs that I've seen that's not originally written in English, and I'm interested in finding out. And I was going to ask about that. Is it, it is it been trans fully translated? There was a Kickstarter to get it translated, and it uh, successfully funded, oh, and I backed it at a level where I'm going to get a nice. Limited deluxe edition hardcover in September. Interesting. Okay, cool. So, so maybe something maybe to stick we can, a maybe yeah. something to stick a pen in. And this is something I've been interested in for a while, or curious about for a while, is what the tabletop RPG scene is like in Japan. Oh, there it's even is one. It's very different. Mm-hmm. Um, for most part, they use, most of their systems focus more on D six based rolling, mm-hmm. um, and they have really weird settings and ideas. Some are really cool, like um, Double Cross, mm-hmm. where it's about basically Japanese X-Men, mm. where you get like themed powers that interact with each other. Mm-hmm. Some of them are just bizarre mm. and borderline creepy, like Maid RPG, mm-hmm. where you play maids. Yeah. <laughs> it so, is, you're saying that there's, there's a Japanese game that is bizarre and borderline creepy or just overtly creepy? That doesn't sound like something you'd find in Japan. No, not, not at, at all. all. No, 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 not at all. Um, yeah, that actually doesn't surprise me that much, though. Yeah. Um, so that, that that could actually be pretty interesting. But think well. about it. Like, but finding those translated might be might be a challenge. Uh, Made RPG is already translated. And I think Double Cross is <laughs> also <laughs> translated. I don't know. The, the more, so every, ironically, the more Jap- quote-unquote Japanese it is yeah. from Western perspective, the more likely it is to have been translated over. Oh, yeah. So, Made RPG was translated years ago. <laughs> so, I don't want to play Soviet women that are, that are like, flying around, you know, by actually planes. doing bi- in biplanes, like, fire, fire bombing Nazis or whatever. Oh, no, no, but no. But no, I do want to play the maid, the maid game. So, yeah. hmm, I don't know. <laughs> that says a lot about you, Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> Who doesn't like maids? That's too much like my day job. Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, another thing that I wanted to do while we have you here is that possibly we can go around and maybe spitball some oddball ideas ourselves and see if we can maybe think how how a system might like crop up based on that setting and based on that co- and or concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, can I define the setting initially? Of course. You are a summer camp instructor. Ooh. Summer camp instructor. Yep. Apparently, Go with it. Apparently this is something that's close to home. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> a little close now, to your day, day yeah. job, huh? Now are all all players are summer are are basically summer camp yep. um, instructors. Yep. 
or counselors. And I guess the GM would then be called the camp director. <laughs> yes, I like that. Actually, I like that. So, <laughs> like that so the GM too. is the camp director, and then, then all the players are the um, camp counselors. And the GM, what he gives them like a task or like gives them a, a theme to set up the 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 camp. Yeah, but so, like, is this camp about doing scientific experiments or different themed science jobs? Oh, or? I immediately went to psychonauts on that one. <laughs> my my hmm. my immediate thought was we need a system for patience. And like, hey, man. You have like hey, instead of health, you have patience. Yeah, yeah. patience. Yeah. When you, you run out of patience, you die. You just snap. Oh. You, you, you go to Oklahoma yeah. for a coke. My, <laughs> yeah, my initial thought, which probably would, doesn't surprise you all, was that uh, this camp was also Camp Crystal Lake. But um, I know. Oh <laughs> takes no. it to a totally different place. But no, you were you were this going for yeah, <laughs> you were probably going for more of a um, uh, not focusing on those elements, but focusing on how do you the, deal with the children? Minutia of, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, that sort of minutia of the the, the camp counselor experience. Um, and I know that's something that that you can certainly speak speak of uh, mechanically. How would you imagine that that would play out? I would think that um, as part of starting the game, you define your characters. You define what the camps, camp or camps are going to be uh-huh. about, and uh, maybe your responsibilities. Like each player could have a different responsibility with. Yeah, camp. like maybe someone is doing the pioneers of flight camp, and they're they're teaching about how things fly and how to make flying things, and they co- do cool paper airplane stunts. Mm-hmm. Um, or someone else is doing uh, chemistry, and they're teaching about reactions and all that. And then I think another part, which probably we could look to Union of Magical Child Care Professionals for inspiration is defining the campers. Yeah, What no, kind of campers say, there's, do there's, you get? There's got to be a chaos die that you yeah. roll periodically to see what there, shenanigans are they getting into and, now. And, I, I think it would be better if the, uh, the, the director mm. gets to decide which camper goes to which camp. Nice. Oh, interesting. And so if they don't like you, they'll give you the problem, child. Or... Mm. or Okay, so but we're all gonna, we would all be in the same camp, right? So it's like which class they go to in the camp. Not necessarily from my job experience personally. There are three different locations: one in Frisco, Capel, and uh, right. But I mean, if we're all sitting on the table playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, we need to interact with each other at some point, or there's no point. So it should be. I'm thinking in, in like trying to develop. Uh, this was going to be a uh, system. Yeah. I'd like us all to be in the same camp, but with different responsibilities or maybe different classes that we teach in that camp. Different so rooms could, in the same building, per, essentially. So yeah. we could still interact in different ways and potentially like somehow you know find a way. Like I find a way to, to to send my problem kids to your class in some potential. In, in a sense, in a sense, the enemies would be the kids. Although you wouldn't be killing them, you'd be trying to calm them down and get them get some sort of productive. Or just keep your sanity. Or keep your keep your sanity. Uh, And then another element I could foresee um, is another hostile element for a camp instructor would be the other camp instructors because you might have limited supplies. Yeah, there you go. First come, first serve. Yes, we can almost turn this into a competitive game. Yeah, I think it could definitely be a competitive. Like you're you're all vying basically to like have the best experience or to get the promotion or whatever the case. Or give them best experience to the kids. Yeah. Should be like, like the, eventually to, to be the favorite. I was gonna yeah. say you, you just get driven insane after a while. So everyone, <laughs> you just every, you just go until everyone's driven insane and you get fired or something like that. And then that. everyone is John. <laughs> <laughs> John was just a camp counselor. <laughs> he saw too much. It becomes paranoia fiasco all rolled into one. Yeah. Day. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, that, that yeah, we didn't mention be... paranoia in this one. That's an interesting one too. Oh yeah. Uh, another, but yeah, that, time. That, the, the, that sounds like it could actually be an interesting um, RPG if at some point we wanted to uh, develop that a little more and try to actually play it. That could be. Who do you think we are? Game designers? Uh, that's a good point. No. <laughs> Maybe a future uh, roll with it unplugged might feature uh, this game. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. We could do go. like a very simple, a simplistic system for it and just kind of have fun playing. After Jim has his chance to be a maid. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wasn't serious about actually playing that. Oh, you right should see the random tables for that game. They are weird. I bet they are actually. I bet they they're are. like creepy, weird. Yeah, uh, I bet they are. Camp maids. That's uh, it. That's oh, it. oh, <laughs> oh. Mm. See, is it a camp for maids or camp by maids? Camp uh, with maids. I don't know. That would be interesting though. Like camp for maids, like maid camp. Yeah, maid camp. Yeah, you teach, <laughs> you teach them camp. to be better. Well, like, that can fit like into our, that can fit our system. If you're thinking the theme of the camp is teach kids to become maids eventually. Didn't that get super? Like, didn't that get really creepy? What parent this? would want to send their kids to that though? It's Not like, really. don't they send their kids to these camps to like you know? It's like, oh, we're yeah, going to make you better over the course of the summer. Like, yeah, we're preparing you to be an engineer. That sounds or like something. some sort of a crazy like work camp, like almost slavery style. Welcome to maid boot camp. That doesn't. The parents were. Not. Their parents were otaku. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's okay. Otaku camp is the next. Oh. 
I would totally do magical children camp. I would. I would. Yeah. Like, you knew a Harry Potter style. Well, we had. You knew a magical child. Well, you mentioned Psychonauts, so that's, right, right. That's that's kind of. And you I ran our Christmas game. Remember? I did. How will I ever forget? <laughs> Where we had David Bowie. Uh, what was it? Mary Poppins and a Time Lord? Was it the Time yeah, Lord? Yeah. And a, a horrifying thing from Lovecraft, mm. right? Teaching children about the nice. true meaning of Christmas. Mm-hmm. Well, and I and I would say another another along this these same lines. Um, have you all played? I assume some of you all played Bully. No. Yeah. On PS, the, sure. it was a PS2 game which I really enjoyed from Rockstar. And um, as opposed to being the camp counselors, you could be. Um, you know, students at a school or students at a camp right. or something Many like that. Many other systems do that, like yeah. Monster Hearts, which is more focused on being hormonal teenagers. Uh, another, also, another apocalypse engine. Uh, yeah, another yeah. apocalypse engine. Yeah. Uh, uh, hormonal teenagers who also happen to be myth- uh, monsters, like yeah. vampires, wolves, and mm-hmm. zombies, and so on. Yeah, so it's like a it's like so it's like a monster school. Although that system has a sex move, mm-hmm. which is what happens when you have sex. Well, technically, yeah, a lot apocalypse of apocalypse world. Seem, <laughs> yeah, apocalypse world slash dungeon world seems really concerned. With Not dungeon world. Dungeon world a lot. Apocalypse so. world does. Apocalypse I played, world. Yeah, I played uh, monster hearts. Apocalypse world so. definitely. Yeah. I like the mortal in that game where you trigger the other character's darkest self, which basically turns them into a raging berserker monster. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, the I love that term too. It's just like the whole the whole system screams angst to me, yeah. which is amazing. It's teenage. Yeah, exactly. What do you think? <laughs> exactly. Works, it's so. awesome. Yeah. So it's like it's my darkest self. I can't let anyone else see it. Uh, when I've seen people <laughs> play Monster Hearts, it looks it it uh, it turns out that they start playing themselves as they were in high school. <laughs> oh God, that oh, would be that would be. <laughs> Maybe terrifying. we don't play this. Maybe yeah. we don't play this game. There's a dark place. Not? If we want to keep this podcast together, we probably don't want to <laughs> let that stuff come out. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's the real um, real question that we're getting at here is since RPG by its very nature is about escapism, it's about being a hero, it's about being all these different things. Um, are we really talking about these oddball systems as being other forms, other iterations of role play, in the sense that you're not a hero? Is that what it's really about? Well, is I that think, the defining characteristic? I, I, th- I think I, I, I wouldn't say. I mean, for me personally, I don't think you necessarily need to be a hero, but it is about it is about experiencing um, something that you may not be able to experience in real life, and whether that's um, Headaches, you know, over the top, migraines. Uh, yeah, exactly. Whether that's something over the top and, and heroic, or if that's something that's mundane, like um, the, well, fourteen mundane. days. Yeah, like fourteen days where you're experiencing, you know, deep debilitating pain, but it's still something that you're experiencing that you wouldn't necessarily experience in your real life, unless you are a, 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 someone that suffers very bad. Because that's pretty extreme too. Because I know some other people that that also suffer from migraines, and that's you have to be. It's it's a pretty elite camp. Uh, to, be, <laughs> to be in that state Look where you the get that camp. exactly, you get that you get to that level where it's like so debilitating that you're consistently to the point so where I'm you just, just gonna lie can't. in bed all day, right? And it's something that that you know I'm I'm certainly thankful that that's only happened to me a couple of times in my life to get to that point. But I know I, I do know some people that that is I mean they struggle with um, on a much more consistent basis. So yeah, I mean that's something that that you're you're experiencing something new, experiencing something different. And that's what I think role playing is all about: is just experiencing mm-hmm. things that you may not be able to experience in your real life. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to be her- 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 Now, I'll also say too, though, that there is something to be said for um, sort of putting a little bit of yourself into a character, just like yes. any yeah. actor would, any author would. Um, you know, you sort it's of hard like, not to. It, yeah, it, well, I think it actually it, it's necessary to because what you're doing essentially in order to role play is put yourself in their shoes yeah. and say, if I was in the situation, how might I react? And then you can sort of change a few things about yourself. Like if I was in the situation and I didn't care about X, or yeah. if I tended to do this, how well, would I behave? And I and I know that one of the things that I that I and I I tend to enjoy doing is I tend to enjoy doing the opposite. Well, mm-hmm. I'll say, okay, this is how I would normally want want to react and want to be. So when I play this character, I'm going to do the opposite, exactly what I would not do in this situation. And that's something that I also mm-hmm. find very fun. Where it's mm-hmm. like I would never do this, mm-hmm. but when I'm playing this character, I'm going to do it because it's like so different from how I how I actually yeah. am. So that's something that, too that I think that, mm-hmm. that that's an element of kind of, kind of like exploring too. like another side of yourself, if you will, in the sense right. that it's not right. You. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And I, I feel like because of the nature of role playing games and allowing us to live lives that we would not uh, not otherwise, mm-hmm. uh, it's not surprising to me to see so many games recently, at least, start to to be mindful of like queer issues and gender identity, um, uh, 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 queer issues and LGBT um, uh, concerns in mm-hmm. their games, like like in Night Witches with mm-hmm. the queer issues. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that's something that I not necessarily look forward to, but I expect to see more of mm-hmm. um, as as it becomes more commonplace and accepted. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Yep. Okay, so our, our I guess we're getting ready to wrap up mm-hmm. here. Um, what do you think? Do we have any other pressing concerns that we want to talk about real quick before we wrap up? Or talk? so, what color would your maid outfit be, Jim? <laughs> oh, it, it would have to be the tradi- I think the traditional black French and white. Maid? Yeah, <laughs> the tra- traditional. Definitely. Wow. Definitely. <laughs> I'm going corporate. I would I would do my hair up in a nice bun though. Okay. For sure. What color hair? How long? Um, it would be it would be long. I'd put it up in a French bun. Uh, I would say sort of in uh, maybe like an auburn sort of color, um, reddish, but but you know reddish brownish hue. I'm going for a falsetto uh, <laughs> Russian accent. <laughs> as you drive your uh, as you fly your uh, your biplane bomber. Right. Exactly. Let's let's hear it. Are you want clean? <laughs> wow. And Is that, that going to be the stinger for the episode? It, oh my I God. don't know. It I might, might be a little bit too close yeah. to the end for that. But uh, on that very disturbing <laughs> note, we're going to call this one a wrap. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us for the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. Absolutely. Yes, episode and, number 36. Yes. And Brian, thank you for joining us. Thank and, you for uh, sharing me. some oddball RPG. I systems. have so many more that I needed yeah. to touch yes, on. I'm sure there is. We'll stick a pin in and maybe call it a part two at a future date. Hey, so no, I don't like getting stuck with pins. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we've got a, a, yes. a, a pen stick in a pen guy stick. who's mm. uh, been ha- it's an had, intern. Yeah, it's yeah. been very hard on him. Lately, it's the voodoo so. month. Yes. <laughs> oh, an undergrad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Jim. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'm Brian. And we'll see you guys next time. Later. Bye. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about some of your favorite oddball or lesser-known tabletop RPGs. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.